Ron, how are you? Oh, fine. <laughs> this is a big day for you across the border. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I voted last week, so. Oh, so. did you? Yeah, I always enjoyed going to the polls, but, you know, now with COVID and everything, we used to have a poll right here in the church, but they, California, a few years ago, basically in Sacramento, everyone could could just mail in their ballots. And so most of us did that. And mm. so it's not as much fun. Yeah. It's always sort of fun going to the poll and seeing your neighbors and casting your ballot. So yeah. Where does California usually lay in that sort of Democrat Republican uh, teeter totter? Heavily Democratic. Oh, did they? Yeah. Yeah. Trump, either the, the polls are almost two thirds Biden over Trump here in California. Oh. So, and, and in fact, the California legislature almost has a super majority of Democrats and of course a Democratic governor. So it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty, very blue state. So yeah. Biden, Biden gets all those, Biden gets all those delegates, no problem. Yes. Um, yeah. So I looked actually, when we used to have polling here, they, they do the counting and they'd have these little sheets and they just have them out there to look at. And so I could sort of look at the way my neighborhood would vote and, um, you know, it's quite democratic, but it's a it's a screen, extremely diverse neighborhood. People people make facile assumptions about ethnic minorities in politics that usually don't weigh out. And people mm. are very complex, and many people who move here from overseas are quite traditional, and they often vote conservative. So, yeah. a lot of people don't realize that they just they don't know anybody except people like themselves. They just watch the news. Yeah. Yeah, there tends to be usually an immigrant population if they're fleeing war or economic conditions, their social leanings tend to be very much in the direction of that social conservatism. Yep, yep. Uh, even though they're grateful to escape where they've been, obviously they bring their worldviews with them on a whole range of social issues. Yep, yep. Yeah. So, well, how are how are things north of the border? The border's been closed for a while. How are you guys faring with COVID in Fraser Valley? Well, it's you know, first of all, the schooling. Uh, it's probably this. I don't know what it's like in California, but all of our courses mostly are online. Okay. Uh, so I try and with my courses do micro lectures that I post on the High Tory Reader website. And then I go out for drinks or coffee or walks with students. So I sort of, or telephone conversation. So I try and bridge that more impersonal micro lecture books to read with more interaction, one form or another, whatever suits, suits the students. So it's, it's not so locked down. We can't try creative alternatives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's... Um, but it certainly is intensifying and it, next semester will be all online as well. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I would, I would imagine, I don't know. I would imagine that would take a degree. If I were a college professor, I would take a degree of fun out of the whole thing because. It does. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think most people go into teaching just because they enjoy being with people, yeah. interacting with them, uh, lingering with them over a drink or a deli or out for coffee or, or something. And when that is all gone, it becomes very more, it's, you're just a more an information factory. That's yeah. all. Yeah. And that's not what good education, you get monkeys to do that sort of thing. So uh, computers, but um, it's the personal element that really makes education, education at its best. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, we, we hadn't, I don't know if you want to, if you don't want to talk about this, that's fine too. But um, you guys have had some, uh, you, you had sent me some emails about, I don't even remember her name. She's a YouTuber um oh lauren she, southern maybe yeah and sure. she was um uh you made her acquaintance and she was taking some classes with you guys yeah. and so you guys kind of got in the middle of the all of the broiling culture war stuff a bit oh yeah no lauren was the one actually who helped launch peterson in 216 she was with rebel media with ezra levant she had left here uh, ufv she took classes with me and uh she was well, she actually ran for the Libertarian Party, uh, didn't do very well, but she uh, she then moved to Toronto from the 
the West Coast was hired by Rebel Media, Ezra Levant, and uh, they were the, she particularly was the one who was instrumental in filming that controversial U of T event that Jordan Peterson was at. So I have all those, oh, she sent me all, and then she did the interview as well with the woman who was doing her PhD with them on looking at personality types and whether they swung to the right or the left or the center and uh, to what degree does type or conditioning predetermine voting or ideological yeah. leaning. So she has a lovely interview uh, of that. That was back in the autumn of 216. And then she went on to increasingly probably become one of the leading divas of the right. Um, and so, yeah, we stay in touch regularly. She's in Australia now. Uh, she's just released another um, a video or docudrama. She's tried to move, I think wisely so. I don't know if you saw the film that came out on the Atlantic uh, called White Noise. It features that. Spencer, uh, Karavec and Lauren. And uh, they came here and did a long two hour interview with me a few years ago. And it was Lauren's uh, hope that in the interview, she would talk about why she was leaving this right, why it didn't make sense intellectually, why it didn't make sense practically, which didn't mean she was swinging over to an uncritical left or a progressive left. She was trying to find some sort of a sane, sensible center by which you hear the best insights of both sides um, and, a lot, and encourage each of them to listen in the midst of these intense, you know, cannons turned on one another culture wars. And so she's, uh, she, she's moved quite a bit to that um, center uh, as a result of you know, her, her own journey, but she knows what it's like on that hyper uber activist right. Yeah. And she certainly received, and I don't know if you read the article a few weeks ago, it was the fellow who did the film, Daniel Ambroso. Yeah, I did read that article. Yeah, and then she responded and I mean, she was off, to, I mean, she was, caricatured and said things about her that he took advantage of her. So then she wrote a, a response, typical feisty Lauren. <laughs> and, uh, but she was hurt badly. And, mm. um, uh, but it, she, as a result of that, I mean, she, she's, she's gone right into the heart of both that very reactionary right, as well as the Atlantic right of the David Frum sort of tradition. And she's increasingly seen the way she's been treated if she doesn't go step before a certain a certain agenda. And so she's a feisty person, but she has a very soft heart. Mm. And I think it's this tension between trying to make sense of the world we live in on the hot button issues without losing your soul Yeah. in, in the process. Well, I think also, I mean, she was obviously quite young in 2016. Yeah. And I believe, I mean, you had sent some some of the stuff over. She's 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 married. She has a child. You know, there, there's a we we've created a culture where um, the youth don't get to be young in yeah. terms of having an understanding that it's gonna it's, you're gonna have to do some bumping around in this world to get your bearings and to figure some things out. And if if we as a if we as a culture don't afford young people the opportunity to uh, to try some things out before, you know, I now I'm in my 50s. Um, I remember people complaining to Tim Keller that he wasn't writing books. He says, hey, anything I would have written in my 20s, I'd want to burn. Anything in my 30s or 40s was probably not fully cooked. You know, you, you need, you want some time to gain wisdom. And both the... Um, the the social media and the the food fights that develop around them just sort of lure people in, and I you know I really feel I, I really feel for um, for young people that get caught in this thing, especially those who are successful, because that's that's almost the worst. Yes. Yeah, and it, a temperament. I mean, if I mean someone like Lauren is is not an apathetic cynical sort of person she's idealistic and passionate and then of course people can go to the right or the the left on that but when they're young it reminds me of i did a longer article a few weeks ago on the um, coleridge and wordsworth and their naive turn to the french revolution 
in the 1790s. And then of course they're living to regret that. Uh, but again, they were in their 20s. They had their criticisms of the world they lived in and uh, they idealized what was happening across the water. Um, they saw an overthrow of what they saw was an oppressive regime. They saw people reacting to it and they saw you know, a better world or what they thought a better world was coming into being only to realize that you know, those who are often oppressed when they get power, they equally oppress. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah, and so you get this, and so then they, you know, they in the seven, late 1790s, out of that comes lyrical ballads of 1798 in which they're rethinking stuff. So uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think people who, who, who tend to do well early just because they're committed, they're intense, they're passionate people. I mean, how can you not love them? Uh, and then they go right into the center of the darkness uh, but out of that, experientially, they learn where not to go into the future. And, and so it's it's learning by pretty intense experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, part of part of what brings us together today is, um, you know, we've spoken about Jordan Peterson in the past, and he has uh, thankfully reemerged from his pause, his um, medical induced pause, and he's announced that He's going to pick up the book of Proverbs, which really does figure into this because the book of Proverbs is a is in many ways in the Bible a manual for young people about how to gain wisdom and 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 learn their way. And so you had some you had some very interesting thoughts about that. So what were your uh, what were your impressions when you um, heard that Jordan was going to pick up the biblical series again and and try his hand at Proverbs? Well, I think his earlier journey and commitment to the role of myth, as I think I mentioned to you, myth is about a moral way of seeing the world and how we live and decisions and consequences through story. And as people allow those stories to get inside of them, um, the hope is that it will allow them to orient their life in a meaningful way direction. So people who capitulate to bitterness or anger or go over to darkness, there are implications for that. So you look at Lord of the Rings, you know, you get Saruman as a white wizard. He makes certain choices out of cynicism, skepticism. So he'll identify himself with, with darkness. Um, you get well, multiple myths really are about a moral vision and the story or a parable or a narrative that is given to us by which we sit on that egg really and see what hatches. And so whether it's, you know, Western myths of the Greek or Roman tradition or Egyptian myths or Indian myths or Chinese myths, Jordan Peterson mined that shaft very, very well. But underneath it really was his argument that there is a structure and particularly in a post-structural world that argues there is no order other than what we make. Um, myth is a way of saying, no, in fact, there is an order. And if you use your freedom to violate it, you will lose your freedom and you'll lose any sense of identity. And so Proverbs in that sense is a continuation of a sense there is a moral order, there's wisdom and wisdom I don't know if we've talked about it before, but I did an article on the difference between gnosis or those who feel they have to absolutely know in terms of ethical issues, political issues, ecological issues, military issues. Um, and then often those who are drawn into an, a, a Gnostic world um, and see the pain, the hurt, the betrayal, they often go the other side to agnosis or agnosticism, which is its own form of knowing. I'm not going to believe anything anymore. So agnosis is just gnosis uh, as well. And wisdom is that middle way, that via media of which Proverbs and many wisdom books are attempting to get at, that be careful of going too far down one direction or another. They both are, are dead ends. But what are the myths that allow us to understand ourselves, our journey, uh, identity, public life in a way which is meaningful over the long run. So I think there's a natural unfolding in that sense of Peterson going 
from myths to Proverbs, because Proverbs, it's certainly in the Hebrew canon, is the quintessential explicit book on by Solomon, you know, a, attempting to address his son. On what is a wise way to live? It was it was interesting to me how um, you know we don't know we know a, a degree about what happened with Jordan. I mean, obviously his um, uh, with again with getting off the benzodiazepine, um, you know, terrible time with that withdrawal. You know, it, in fact, had to go all the way was in the United States for a while. Had to go to Russia and then was um, recovering somewhere in the Balkans when he came down with COVID, um, sort of re-emerged in, uh, re-emerged back at home around Canadian Thanksgiving, and then, and then able to get in front of his camera again. And we haven't heard much about the second book yet in terms of whether he was able to finish that, but the, um, the Proverbs to me seemed an interesting choice, partly because his, his emphasis, you know, I think, I think part of what happened towards the end of his time was he, he sort of got caught up into the overtly political realm. That's really what took him to prominence, you know, at the same time as Lauren Southern. And, and I think especially the book tour sort of drew him there. So it was peculiar. It was interesting. And I think actually encouraging to me that he, he comes back from this, you know, in, in what would be in his um, terminology, a trip to the underworld for for six to nine months, and then reemerge with, um, okay, we're going to do the biblical series. Didn't really announce much beyond that, and then Proverbs, especially given, I think, sort of how you and I both saw he him in terms of really coming, really being seen by young men often in our cultures as someone who could guide them. His book was 12 Rules for Life, which was, you know, it, it, had its, it had its mythic elements in it, but it was fairly straightforward and didactic as 12 rules were, you know, do this, don't do that. And so it was very interesting to see Proverbs come up and I think a, I think a good choice for him. Um, do, you, do you think that, timing will be the same though i mean now looking back we're just on election day 2020 uh trump is the not is not the same individual he was in 2015 2016 the times are not the same i think in some ways it's a more cynical jaded time um obviously peterson has a huge fan base out there who will at least give him give him an initial listen do you think the do you think the times will be different? What, what what do you think? Just you know, of course we don't know. How do, how does he play in terms of the difference between 2016 and 2020? Well, as you say, I think the context historically is a little different. I think certainly the United States, they've seen a certain level of arrogance and where it can go. I mean, I know some Christians tend to see him as Cyrus. I think he's probably closer to Pharaoh or Belshazzar in Daniel than, than, than Cyrus. But uh, unless something unusual happens, I see Pharaoh or Belshazzar going down and, and there'll be a sort of a relief uh, uh, will emerge in the American context and the broader ripple effect from that as well. And out of that, I think, and this is where maybe Peterson factors in, um, but where people will identify with him also, he's to use Coleridge's rhyme in the Ancient Mariner, he's a sadder but a wiser person for what he has suffered and what he has been through. And so for those who lean on the cynical side, the skeptical side, those who've gone to places of paralysis and impotence and not knowing what to do or what to think, he can identify with them, he's been there. He's, you know, like Dostoevsky, he's been on the, in the underground, like Dante, he's, he, he, he's been in the inferno. So his work on Proverbs will um, not only focus on Proverbs, but it will draw this rich literary experience as well as personal experience together. Um, 
he's never been tempted by gnosis in that sense. He's always been suspicious of herdism of the right or the left. And, and this is what gives him a voice on the right, basically wooing people, sort of be careful. Uh, you go too far down that direction, you lose your humanity. And above all else, and this is, we talked a little earlier, this is the 60th anniversary of Boris Pasternak's death, 1960. And Dr. Zhivago, at the heart of Dr. Zhivago, and, and Peterson does draw from these great Russian classics, um, Solzhenitsyn and Dostoevsky, uh, people who know the darkness, know the no herdism or groupthink, or what Lewis would call the inner inner ring and how you lose your soul in the process. I think with his work on Proverbs, if he does it wisely in a nuanced way, because the danger sometimes of Proverbs, it can be formulaic. And then if you do this, good will come, plenty will occur. And it's a bit of a simplistic view of life. And so I think he has the wisdom to not see it as cliche, uh, formulaic morals because he suffered too much to say if you know you you live wisely you live justly um, that good will emerge that you know the family the family will grow healthy the crops will be plentiful um, it's sort of the a success a comedic sort of an ending he's known tragedy too much and I think many in the United States obviously have suffered in the last considerably the last few years, just what's happened. And so I think the Americans and others are coming out of a painful period of their history. And out of that, they're gonna be looking for wisdom and insight. And I think if Pro if Perguson does Proverbs, not in a silly formulaic manner, but grapples with Proverbs, I think he can move into the next level of addressing people who are longing for wisdom not just cynicism, skepticism, or let's have another ideological agenda uh, by which we can beat others with. He can offer, and you can see the suffering on his face. And yeah. of course you follow the face into the soul. Yeah. So what do you think? I don't know. I, you know, I've spoken with over the last couple of years, I've spoken with a number of people who who know him personally, um, a number, quite a few former students. And part of the, you know, some of the issues that we've talked about in previous conversations, to, to what degree does he have more? Uh, some students, some students had been on the Jordan Peterson ride before he ever got famous. And they had, um, they were either undergrad students or, um, or graduate students with him or both. And, and they came to the position that he had, if you go back over his uh, years of teaching on YouTube, there's his, you know, he, his, for the most part, his stuff was there for quite a while. And sort of by virtue of his digging in about pronouns, really more about compelled speech than the pronouns necessarily, that suddenly he gets rocketed onto this stage. And I think in some ways at that, at that, that inflection point that was 2016, um, you know, he came to prominence, the, the, the man in the moment found, you know, came together. I don't know. I don't know if we will see that happen again. Again, there are there are a huge number of individuals out there who love him, feel deeply grateful to him because he really helped turn some lights on for them and put them in another direction. But almost everything he did from April 2018 to June 2019 felt um, and my best word for it is decadent. It, um, increasingly he was, he was sort of over there on the political spectrum rather than the addressing individuals and how to improve their lives. Uh, the mythology sort of, sort of receded. It was much more direct. And so I'm, I'm, I think Proverbs is a good choice for him. But I agree with you that 
I've, you know, as a preacher, I've, and I know other preachers have done it successfully. I've never really gone into the book of Proverbs because it's a far trickier book than would be apparent. People sort of go into it, they'll read individual Proverbs and sort of in their own mental space, they just kind of read through, read through, read through, find one that sort of catches for them and say, aha, here it is. But the, you know, the path of wisdom, you know, lady wisdom, there's a much deeper thread to that book. And um, whereas people sometimes will take an individual proverb and say, well, here's, here's the key. Well, the book of Proverbs has a lot of Proverbs, and, and I think it, it invites the reader to come in, and I think just as you said, um, sort of a balance of gnosis and, and, and agnosis, where you're saying, okay, well, this seems to be true, this seems to re be right, but, but then from over here, we see this, and so the, the, the way of wisdom is a way of, of recognizing that we cannot map this world to the degree of perfection so that we can own it and wield it. And the process of wisdom is a careful interchange of, in a sense, working dialectically with the world as sort of a partner. And, and that's really where lady wisdom comes in. And, and, and if, you know, in some ways, Lady Wisdom is the, you know, you know, the Lord Yahweh is is very male, <laughs> and Lady Wisdom sort of comes in and invites the young man to, okay, now learn from me in a in a more sensitive, feminine way, the subtleties of this world, the fact that. Although you may be a strong young man, you can't necessarily grasp it with both hands and make it your own. You're going to have to make your way subtly and engage in, in, in conversation and back and forth to actually learn. Um, and of course, Old Testament wisdom, chokmah, excellence. And you know, people often, Solomon was the wisest king. Well, Solomon was the most skilled king. And, and so, again, I, I see a great deal of potential there for Peterson because he did call young men into wisdom. But it's, you know, there's, there's going to have to be, I think, another level of nuance and interplay that if he really wants to bring out some of the riches in the book of Proverbs, it's it's going to take something a little bit different than just sort of the the big myth, which of course Genesis was so rich with. Yeah, uh, I I think some of your points are very well taken in that uh, he did perhaps get addicted too much to the treadmill of the populist tour and the big crowds, and then inevitably the fall comes from that because people can only move that fast for so long, but myth is a mother load. It's a gold mine that there is no end, not only the myths themselves, but how the myths are interpreted and applied for people's lives. And myth is about, about wisdom. I think your point is very well taken in terms of Proverbs because you get two levels in Proverbs. And if people sometimes get hooked on one and not the other, they miss it. One is sort of the moral insights if you do this, if you follow wisdom, you'll be on a good path. You'll have things will work out well. If you don't, if you're simple minded, if you're these are the, so on the one that that exists. On the other hand, there's the dynamic of lady wisdom who comes to us in the midst of life's complex realities. She woos, she calls, she bids, she, you know, invites, uh, evokes, and that's a more dynamic quality in the midst of often competing goods in life, uh, then how do you make sense? So there is this, in that sense, I don't want to keep returning to Pasternak and Dr. Zhivago, but uh, Laura is very much the wisdom figure in Dr. Zhivago, of which Zhivago himself is constantly struggling to make sense of. And he's a Hamlet-like figure, in many ways paralyzed by his own doubting Thomas temperament versus the 
political idealists, Pasha and Strelnikov, who see life black and white, they sacrifice their humanity for the purpose of a vision and they do destruction on one and all. Uh, Zhivago sees where that leads and it, it, it's like, I'm not buying into this. Okay, so what are you buying into? Well, I can't believe in anything. So he becomes, he's the Hamlet figure. So the first poem in Dr. Zhivago is Hamlet and Pasternak was one of the great Russian translators of European literature of which Hamlet was one of his key works. Um, so wisdom in Proverbs then, which you many interpreters of Zhivago and Pasternak see really Zhivago is a literary outworking of Proverbs mm. uh, in that sense. And so you get, uh, you know, Lady Wisdom in Proverbs. Well, Larissa or Laura in Zhivago is Lady Wisdom who will not buy into simple formulas mm -hmm. of how you bring about the good, the just, the revolution. You don't support the revolutionary cause. You don't support the czarist regime. And of course, Pasternak lived that. And um, sad in many ways is, you know, the, the implications he suffered just as a Solzhenitsyn, uh, just as a Solzhenitsyn it would be interesting if Peterson ever um, did Proverbs and Dr. Zhivago, uh, be, because it takes you into, there are no simple moral maxims when you get in a, a historic situation like that. Yeah. And even if a person, you know, the culture wars we live today, I mean, people on the left, they can shrink a vision that simplifies what justice or peacemaking is. And that can happen on the right as well. Yeah. And there's a longing for humans to be part of a community, but then the question, what's the price you pay to belong to this tribe, this clan? And so where does Lady Wisdom in, in Proverbs fit in beyond little moral maxims? And I think this is the tension of Proverbs. And if Peterson can draw that out, uh, looking at, yeah, there's these maxims, but there's more to Proverbs than that. It's a much more nuanced um, book that calls people into how to listen in the middle of a difficult public hot button areas in life and to know how to stick handle around the landmines, the tribal commitments and the implications of saying no to someone and then being as it were spit on for doing so. But yeah, I, I, I agree there is this, if, if Proverbs is interpreted wisely as it is about wisdom, you've got the divine feminine uh, and uh, you've got the much more dialogical element with the moral maxim. So it's this tension. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, Peterson and I, I usually I look at Peterson sort of October 2016 to June 2019. This is Peterson's first wave. And he, of course, was categorized in a certain way. And I think misframed by many in the culture war context as um, as sort of uh, brutally masculine. And I and I you know listened to far more of his his content than many of his critics, and I often found him quite balanced. You know when he would say things like you know, you know what woman wants a wants a man who hasn't grown up. And so I think in the first wave, the the message was really to men, you know, grow up, take responsibility, kind of a moralist in that way, and and in that sense perhaps giving voice to that one voice in the book of Proverbs. But I, I could see if he would pick up on lady wisdom now and, and bring out the feminine, that could be an extremely, um, for, you know, I, I think that could be, especially for his audience, um, an extremely powerful thing. If he could um, if he could, you know, when I started, when I started my meetup here locally, I was explaining to some people of the church what was going on. I was saying, yeah, mostly my meetup are a lot of single, single young men in their 20s and 30s. And, you know, one of the women of my church said, well, you know, what, ha what would happen if we could draw a bunch of uh, single young women in their 20s and 30s? Wouldn't that sort of help the meetup along become, in a sense, a, a full congregation. And if Peterson can, I think, as you said, 
bring in Lady Wisdom and bring in this, this second, you know, the first sort of the first easy layer, moral maxims for success, but the second more subtle layer, um, which I think as you, you know, is the more feminine, drawing the attention to, okay, here's the, here's the one point, let's bring in the other. If he could have his second wave sort of round out the first wave, that could do um, that could do a lot, I think, not only in terms of uh, continuing to educate, mature, and satisfy his established audience, but also bring into it um, really much more respect and understanding from some women out there. Now he he has a he had, you know, I'm not going to say that his initial audience was mostly men, but certainly men grabbed onto it. If he could sort of round that out. And I, you know, given what I saw, especially before his content before October 16, most of his classes had women in it. And he was a popular professor. He clearly knows how to engage a female audience. And if he could use proverbs to sort of pivot and bring the women in and put his audience together, that has, I would think, tremendous potential and could really do a lot of good to sort of heal this men against women culture war we've got going now. And so that that would be a, a truly remarkable thing if he can pull that off. Yeah, no, I know I would agree if he's eminent inevitably when you go to myth you've got the dark sides of the male and the female and underneath human nature you've got both aspiration and demonization it's the shadow uh, but if he's overplayed like even his sometimes constant critique of frozen and then you get audiences laughing and you want to say oh come come you, you don't have to turn on this particular disney film uh, the issues that are being grappled with in Frozen go much deeper than male female issues. Uh, and um, but for some, I think many women felt this was an attack against feminism because obviously the men are portrayed as adults in some ways are quite incompetent and stumbling around and it's women who are grappling with with the big issues. But yeah, I would agree if he he can bring together his rich reservoir, that he has of myth and the wisdom which is embodied in myth and then link up that with proverbs and lady wisdom uh, that can be dynamic it can be quite explosive actually in terms of bringing together the best of the feminine and the masculine while being acutely aware that both can have tendencies to be egoistic narcissistic indulgent uh, and that's just the tension is what goes back to Plato, the dark and the light, dark and the light horse uh, in, in that sense. But yes, I, I would agree if his uh, approach to Proverbs emerges with a deep respect for Lady Wisdom and how she calls, she woos uh, into a relational journey, not just a maxim journey, little ethical. So. So 12 rules is a bit like Proverbs without the relational side, without lady wisdom. Right. You know, this is this is the road you walk and do what you're told. And if you don't do what you're told, these are the, well, life's more subtle than that. Uh, but often that is needed as well. Yeah. Yep. Uh, it's, it's, so it should never be, some people's minds think in terms of Manichaean either or a dualism. It's always this, how do you hold together uh, structure, but dynamism within structure and flexibility in structure too? Right. That's much harder to do. And if he can use Proverbs and even Exodus, because I mean, Exodus allegorically is about leaving the Egypt of your false self, entering into the desert where there's uncertainty. And now who am I? I thought I was a citizen of this world, even though it was difficult in Egypt and I was oppressed. Um, but now I've got out of the cage and my just going from one cage into another cage at this time I'm absolutely lost in the desert of non being I mean he can certainly read exodus mythically allegorically and if he he brings together exodus and proverbs 
uh, it could be dynamite in yeah. terms of because Exodus is not just a moral maxims. It's people floundering and feeling their way, <laughs> wanting to return to the leeks and melons of Egypt. But they're going forward into new being, new possibilities. And the price of freedom is not easy. It's easier to retreat to unfreedom in a cage, which is predictable, secure, ordered. Uh, but, you know, faith calls you to freedom from that, to overcome that longing that need and so lady wisdom lady was you find the same thing in dr Zhivago. apologies for returning to it oh that's fine but but it's the same thing you know the laura is always calling her first husband strelnikov to come back to his humanity you become um, a, a ruthless ideologue that's burning villages in the name of the perfect utopian society but at the end of his life he, he longs for laura again yeah. And he realizes as as the clan he has served, he's disposable because he no more agrees with their agenda. And he begins to return to his deeper longings and deeper needs, which is Laura. Jivago does the same thing. And this is where you get the tensions of lady wisdom trying to sort out these men, you know, in, in, in terms of misguided desires uh, where they've sold themselves uh, for a utopian dream. Yeah. Strelnikov, the other, I can't believe in anything. He's, he's the Hamlet figure, uh, but she's the wisdom figure. And so I, I think if Peterson could even, I mean, in that sense, Zhivago is a far more nuanced book than Solzhenitsyn or Dostoevsky. Mm. Mm. Uh, and it's worked out in the midst of very intense culture wars, mm. uh, which gives it a perennial significance for us today. Obviously, we're not in Russia, uh, yeah. but the intensity of tribes lining up, interpreting certain hot button issues, rejecting those who don't buy into a cancel culture. Well, that's that's just classic Dr. Zhivago. And so mm. uh, the one temptation is the Strelnikov. The other is the cynic the Zhivago, there's the wisdom, there's the Laura. Uh, and so, I mean, if Peterson could pick up on something like Zhivago and Proverbs, there's a dynamism there that I think could be quite profitable for people wanting him to take the next step in his own journey, as well as yeah. interpreting Proverbs, Deuteronomy. What do you think about that? Well, I, I, like, I like how you brought Exodus into it, because, again, I think part of the Part of the first wave was was the timing, but I've been preaching through I've been preaching through Exodus for the last um, number of months, and Exodus is is this. You know we're we're in we've been in a a cultural phase of revolution, where we imagine the. Um, you know, we we identify the we we identify the enemy. Um, you know, it's it's Pharaoh, and Pharaoh has enslaved us, and Pharaoh is is genocidal, and of course, the Lord does this work of of the plagues, and they go out, but now they're out in the desert, and as just as you said you know, very quickly, they're thinking about the uh, leeks and onions in Egypt. And uh, remember back in the good old days when we didn't even have to, you know, when they gave us straw for our bricks and, ah, oh, gosh, wasn't it wonderful to be a slave? And so um, I, in terms of the, the Peterson's audience, and I mean, I got into this partly simply because I, I saw he was, I saw he was lighting up individuals and they were making choices in some ways to get out of their mother's basement but i also knew that they were going to need a community to get out into um you can't i mean if you go in jordan peterson i mean in some ways he was like a traveling evangelist or preacher he would get out there turn on the audience people would have a vision for a new life but you don't just um get a new life out of a vision and ambition to have one the actual creation of a new life you know certainly requires as we've said that you know keep your room clean um you know learn a few things before you open your mouth do all of that do all of those maxims but very quickly into it you discover that many of the um many of the bondages 
that have that produced the slavery you were suffering under are not simply from Pharaoh, they're inside yourself. And so, of course, Exodus begins with the uh, deliverance from Egypt. God comes in with this mighty work. And then very quickly, you know, we've got some we've got some problems right away. And then you're at Sinai and then you've got these 10 words. And um, so here now is the shape of the new life. And of course, uh, they're not going to they're not going to make it. They're going to struggle and they're going to go to the edge of the promised land and they're going to panic. And, the, you know, our children are going to be killed. And so, no, actually, you're going to go back into the desert and die and your children are going to take the land, mm -hmm. which is, of course, how the story continues. So I, you know, I again, I am I'm just tremendously I was just tremendously pleased to see Jordan able to make a YouTube video, a brief one, get to the point of wellness where he could say, these are my plans. I hope his health holds so that he can follow through on them. And, and I, I really hope that he um, takes the time to be able to maintain his health and to be able to follow through with Proverbs. And I, I, again, I was so pleased it wasn't 12 more rules from life, new book tour. I'm going to go out in places and talk about how the left is bad and we're losing Western civilization. You know, there's, there's truth in lots of that, but the, the truly enduring work he will do, I think is much more along the lines of this large community of men and women who on the basis of his first wave have made improvements in their life. And how can they go on, work from their gains, um, continue to not only sort out themselves as individuals, be able to integrate into an established community. And of course, in my frame, build communities that will probably, if not be churches, be church-like, um, build uh, productive family relationships, have children, you know, basically get on with building a civilization. So um, I, um, again, I, I see the potential there, but it's a it's a big order. Well, I think if he the um, obviously Proverbs, you're dealing with a, a father son, but the father also genuflects to Lady Wisdom. So you right. get an interesting. But then the nice thing about Exodus, which I think is a complement to Proverbs, is that you get you know, as they're leaving Egypt, you get how the complex nature of a community and the divisive nature and people turning on one another. And uh, so how do you hold together a community um, where there's division, where there's people lining up on different sides? It can be personally, it can be theological, it can be political, or we're not getting the bread, we're not, we're not getting the water, and Moses, you're not leading, or where's Aaron? Um, people complaining and people cynical. One temptation is to just drop out and say, I'm not, I'm going back to Egypt. Okay, this is a utopian idea. It makes no sense. I'm going back to the cage, to slavery. Um, the other is just to be uncritical entirely and just genuflect to whatever authority is. The more difficult and more mature one is how does one live together in the midst of community when there's conflict, when there's tension, when there's uncertainty, but knowing how to listen to Lady Wisdom as she guides the community forward. Uh, and so if Exodus, because Exodus is just a classic tale of community trying to find itself on the road mm -hmm. with all the, the reactions people can have to that. So Proverbs is more father, son, you know, family, lady wisdom. Okay, now let's broaden that out to actually a community trying to break free from in, uh, uh, injustice in a pharaonic dynasty. Uh, but what's the price you pay for communal justice? Well, it's often, you know, clashes, horn budding, disagreements, people walking off in a huff, uh, all of these very human aspects and so that way exodus is a wonderful complementary story of okay so how do we actually communally leave egypt and how does lady wisdom beyond just dad and son and family 
the sort of the small oikos unit. When you move from oikos in the Greek sense to polos or public communal life, um, how do people remain loyal yet critical? Many people are critical but not loyal. Then you can have loyal people who are not critical. But Exodus, well, exodos is just the path out. So the path out of our false self, our what Shakespeare would say being cabin cribbed and confined uh, into our new freedom. How does that work in a non-utopian manner? Oh, that's good. That's good. Um, I think that's I think that's probably good for for Peterson and Proverbs. Any any books you're writing or have written recently, Ron? What are what are you been what are you, what are you been working on? Are you doing something on Dr. Zhivago? Well, yeah. As as I said, there's a there's a bunch of us in Europe and North America around the world because it's the 60th anniversary since Pasternak died. Uh, we're all reading not only Zhivago but many of other Pasternak's works. Not only because of the epic nature of the novel, but also trying to look at the relationship of Pasternak, Zhivago, um, then and now in the midst of the intense culture wars and people lining up between different tribes on the right or the left, and often those who become cynical in the midst of that, they can't believe anyone. So what can a, what can a, a Laura, what can a Lady Wisdom, what are the types in Dr. Zhivago we see, you know, on the stage of public life all over the place today? Those sort of actors, as it were, they're different people, but the script remains the same. Yeah. Just new actors come on stage and yeah. they uncritically, you know, trot out their little role on the stage of life, uh, often uncritically acting out of a script. So Pasternak, and also he brings in, which I think Peterson understands, and, and I hope he holds intention, is the whole tragic element of life. Um, in that, because we, uh, in the West, largely at a more popular level through Walt Disney and certain epic works, it, it's a comedic approach. You, there is the agon, there is the struggle people face, and if people are, you know, honest and, and try and overcome their difficulties, then the ending is generally good. So you get the great epic, say, of, you know, the last decade or, or so, Lord of the Rings, there's the struggle in each of the books, it ends good. Middle Earth is saved, Aragon is on the throne, Gandalf is happy. Harry Potter faces his issue, and finally, the, you know, the, uh, it, it ends happily. Voldemort is, is banished. Uh, you get Star Wars, the Jedi's finally, you know, defeat the Sith. Um, you get uh, Chronicles of Narnia, they all in, they're comedic in, in that sense. Now, obviously, Walt Disney is a cruder form of those more layered and subtle. But what they don't give us is what happens when there is, isn't a happy ending. Hmm. What happens when the women and men who try and live wisely and well, the son who listens to the father, um, those who listen to Lady Wisdom, it ends, it ends in tragedy. And so just to sort of maybe retell a tale what Pasternak uh, does with the St. George and the Dragon one. Most of us, when we think of St. George and the Dragon, we think of St. George fighting for injustice as the dragon that has to be slain so the land will be pure and clean. There's usually a lady who has the dragon has stolen. So the myth unfolds in a way. Um, if you're gonna live your life meaningfully like a St. George, you have to uh, engage the dragons and there are different things in your life. Uh, you have to save people who are victimized, in this case, mythically, the divine feminine. Uh, obviously that can be reversed, but the St. George and the dragon does end happy. Um, so that there's the notion that the good is victorious over the evil, the real even, the, the dragon is slain. You get this in Lord of the Rings, Smog is slain, uh, Nibelung and Lied, uh, Siegfried kills the dragon. Uh, it ends positively. Now what Pasternak does with his story of, uh, and this fits more into a tragic side, and it's not that he's only tragic, he tries to hold together comedic and tragic. So, uh, uh, you know, a more cliche or simplistic or formulaic life is not done. So, so St. George is going on his horse. He hears the dark breathing of the dragon in the cave and the smoke and the poisonous fumes that come out. He knows he has to deal with the dragon of injustice or brutality or bitterness or anger, all of these things that can be internal. 
or external. Uh, so he begins to uh, engage the dragon, but what happens is he falls off his horse, the horse kills the dragon, then the horse is killed, and, and, uh, and St. George himself falls in the ground, the woman falls in the ground, and what Pasternak does, he says, you have it at the end of the fairy tale, do they both die? And there is no happy ending, or are they both? And so you have an ambiguous future open it. So out of the desire for justice or what is right or facing into injustice of the dragon, the mythically the dragon, which you find in many places, um, within the standard mythological read, there's victory, it's overcome. Pasternak lives through the Russian Revolution. He sees good people. Um, it doesn't work out. He himself obviously suffered as a result of Solzhenitsyn suffered, a Dostoevsky suffered uh, like this. He knows it. Uh, he's much more tender in his writing and more lyrical and poetic than his souls in its and, and Dostoevsky. He's, um, but he wants to say, don't slip into formulas, yeah. <laughs> you know, and yeah. just because you want to do the good doesn't mean uh, the means you use or the end you're going to live in is necessarily going to be a, a health and wealth prosperity, yeah. um, which you get in Proverbs a little bit. Um, yeah. And this is where I think Lady Wisdom, because Laura and Zhivago and Strelnikov and Komarovsky and yeah, I mean, all these people are grappling with the comedic, but they're living in a tragic. And so how do these two come together? So maybe we could even call this little dialogue Pasternak, Peterson and Proverbs. <laughs> <I don't laughs> that, that would work. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. But how do you bring together this? Uh, and, and I just mentioned the St. George one because that's of these poems at the end of Dr. Zhivago. Hmm. He, he rethinks a myth. And of course, Peterson uh, deeply appreciates myth. Yeah. But then he reframes it in a way that be careful when this myth is told, St. George and the Dragon, you don't do the comedic. Pasternak's life story, like Souls and Itzen's Dostoevsky, is not necessarily yeah. you know, materialistic health and wealth. These people live in immense tragic elements. And even when Souls and Itzen gets out of Russia, these psychological dynamics that he lived with all, I mean, you read the writings of Alexander Schmemann and Souls and Itzen, you know, very painful. The, yeah what he had to live with. When I was on staff with Amnesty International, some of the best women and men and, you know, politically I had to work on their behalf. They'd been tortured in prison. So, I mean, now when we'd managed, for those we did manage to get out of um, these tragic circumstances, um, these people psychologically for the rest of their life were, you know, um, they'll never overcome those things. It's a, it's a, so physically they're yeah. out of torture they're not prisoners anymore but their internal souls have been damaged for life and there's a tragic side to that so i would think if you know the pastor sort of the pasternak peterson proverb as long as that tragic comedic side is lived in tension because if you go too far down the tragic you're you're just into cynicism and what's the point of doing anything and life is you know short nasty and brutish and it's just a world of wolves against wolves and i can't trust it well that's the agnosis that's cliff's edge the other is naive comedic if i just do this i follow this formula if i do these little aphorisms in the proverbs there'll be things will work out well no not really uh, and then people become cynical of the Bible or of God if they're presented this particular worldview. And then they have deaths or illnesses, or, you know, even something is like families or, well, I thought if I served God, then there, you know, the family would be healthy and wealthy and, you know, many children and have a good job and the house would look well. Hmm. So what happens when life doesn't work that way when a curveball comes, which is tragic and it's sad. So how then does a person process wisdom, the relationship to God, the relationship to faith? So Pasternak to his greatness, um, as he's drawing on sort of Greek tragedians like Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, or Shakespeare, you know, Hamlet, Lear, Macbeth, uh, or say Robinson Jeffers, a great poet in California, Carmel, uh, um, Hardy, um, so it's 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 these, and I think if Peterson and he he certainly has lived suffering. He understands tragedy. He knows the myths, uh, and so to the degree he can read proverbs in a dynamic way, 
and not a comedic formulaic way, I think he will reach a whole new level, uh, a whole new audience in that yeah. sense. What do you think? Well, I, I agree. I'd throw another P, pastoring, because, you know, as a pastor, pastor of an older, a kind, an aging congregation, which is mine, you know, one of the things in my 20-some year tenure here is that you're walking people into the later stages of their lives, which mm -hmm. is for almost everyone, a period of loss. You, you begin to lose your health. You're losing some of your agency. You're losing your influence. Um, you're, you, know, you know where this road is going, but you have no idea exactly the, you know, the passage it will take. Maybe there'll be a, a sudden heart attack and life will be lost. Maybe there'll be cancer and you'll have to walk this road of not knowing. And um, how do you do this? So no, I think that's I think that's Ron. I think that's really a, a good word, and it's um, I, I'm not I personally I'm not familiar with Pastor Knack at all, and and you've kind of mode as you so often do motivated me to pick up yet another book, um, but the um, and and I think that's especially helpful for the second wave for Peterson because again a lot of the people. My, my life has, you know, Jordan Peterson put me on a different trajectory in that, you know, I not only have this local congregation now sort of pulled apart by COVID, but I have this online congregation, mm -hmm. uh, which is considerably larger than the in-person congregation. And now two, three years into it, sort of energized by Peterson's vision, but okay, now people are in the trenches. It's in their relationships. It's in, it's making life work with one another. Uh, we have a Discord server, which is sort of a focal point of the community. And um, it's, you're, you're exactly right. And it's, it's figuring out the tension because you, you have to have both visions and you have to work both visions. And a life well lived is in fact working both of those visions. And again, I think Peterson has, um, if there's, if we've learned anything about his life since he's been on the the big stage, it has been both of those visions. Suddenly, he he takes off into the stratosphere, and his book sells five million copies, and he's terribly in demand. And then, you know, oh, the doctor, you know, was stumbled up on, you know, an anti-anxiety medication, and. You know, he who gave advice now is the is the patient, and of course, there have been plenty of um, of that type of thing out in the cruel social media. It's not a blogosphere anymore. We don't have a new word for it yet. But so so yeah, I I agree completely, and um, I I would love to see him. You know, I I've never read him, but I'd love to see him include because he does have a sense for the Russian, you know, the Russians. So. Um, maybe picking up Pasternak and 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 weaving this in because Peterson, obviously, with his emphasis on suffering, has never been one for a, a Pollyanna view of life. That was never Jordan Peterson. So, but to see him to see him piece this together, and especially, you know, I don't know the the medical situation for his wife or himself, but he. Um, he is facing a time in his life where his daughter is, you know, she's married, has a child, his son is now married, he and his wife have had some serious medical issues. You know, you and I get to the stage in life where, well, what will the next 20 years look like? They might be healthy, they might be, um, we will certainly age. What, what do we, how do we live well in the midst of those tensions? So no, I think that's a, I think it's a really helpful and good word. Yeah, and I think Proverbs and Exodus would be, if they're brought together as dancing partners, um, I think some amazing familial, public, communal dynamics could be thought could be thought through if the books are, you know, held together in unity, yep. Yep. and and uh, hopefully it's handled wisely and well, and that's always it could really advance um, what he has to offer. Yeah. In terms yeah. of the table that is spread, there will be the food will be new, more nutritious for the soul. Yeah. 
and I think more people will come to it. And if he matures into this next stage, I think he can bring a level. And it's always good when you draw from great texts of the past yeah. so that you're not just making it up. And, right. and of course, Proverbs and Deuteronomy, well, the Bible is, I mean, one of the foundation texts of Western civilization. So uh, to, to make it, to, um, to articulate its relevance for us today is a, I mean, it's a noble calling. It's yes. a noble calling. It's, it's, it's ongoing pastoral existential relevance. Uh, and if he unpacks it wisely and well, I think we'll see him draw in more people and also his own life will be deepened as a result of that also. I agree. I agree. I think it's a good place to wrap this up. So hey. Ron, thank you again for your time. Okay, and maybe maybe you can do Pasternak Peterson, um, Pasternak Peterson and Proverbs. That that Proverbs may very well and, be and the title. <laughs> and you were going to bring pastoring, so the fourth one. That's right. Yeah, and so pastoring. I, I think the pastoring one is very important, very very important in all of that as well. No, I agree. Thank you much, Ron. Okay, it's great to see you. Okay, chat later. All right, bye bye. Bye bye.